The Space Shuttle Columbia disaster was a fatal incident in the United States space program that occurred on February 1, 2003, when the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated as it re-entered the atmosphere, killing all seven crew members. During the STS-107 launch, a piece of the insulative foam broke off from the Space Shuttle external tank and struck the thermal protection system tiles on the orbiter's left wing. When Columbia re-entered the atmosphere of Earth, the damage allowed hot atmospheric gases to penetrate the heat shield and destroy the internal wing structure, which caused the orbiter to become unstable and break apart. Except for one mission to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, subsequent Space Shuttle missions were flown only to the ISS to allow the crew to use it as a haven if damage to the orbiter prevented safe re-entry. 3-148 at launch, it consisted of the orbiter, which contained the crew and payload, the external tank, and the two solid rocket boosters. 215 operational orbiters were built during the Space Shuttle program. The orbiter contained the crew compartment, where the crew predominantly lived and worked throughout a mission. E-53 Space Shuttle main engines were mounted at the aft end of the orbiter and provided thrust during launch. When the Space Shuttle launched, the orbiter and SRBs were connected to the ET, which held the fuel for the SSMEs. During the design process of the Space Shuttle, a requirement of the ET was that it would not release any debris that could potentially damage the orbiter and its TPS. The integrity of the TPS components was necessary for the survival of the crew during re-entry, and the tiles and panels were only built to withstand relatively minor impacts. On STS-1, the first flight of the space shuttle, the orbiter Columbia was damaged during its launch from a foam strike. The bipod connects the ET near the top to the front underside of the orbiter via two struts with a ramp at the tank end of each strut. The ramps were covered in foam to prevent ice from forming that could damage the orbiter. The debris strike removed a tile. The exposed orbiter skin was a reinforced section, and a burn through may have occurred if the damage was in a different location. None of the cameras recording the launch had a clear view of the debris striking the wing, resulting in the group being unable to determine the level of damage sustained by the orbiter. After receiving notification of the debris strike, engineers at NASA, United Space Alliance, and Boeing created the debris assessment team and began working to determine the damage to the orbiter. 140, 143 Intercenter Photo Working Group believed that the orbiter's RCC tiles were possibly damaged, while NASA program managers were less concerned over the danger caused by the debris strike. To assess the possible damage to Columbia's wing, members of the debris assessment team made multiple requests to get imagery of the orbiter from the Department of Defense. 152 to 153 maneuvering the orbiter to allow its left wing to be imaged would have interrupted ongoing science operations, and Ham dismissed the DoD imaging capabilities as insufficient to assess damage to the orbiter. 153 to 154 following the rejection of their imagery request, the debris assessment team did not make additional requests for the orbiter to be imaged. The loss of bipod foam on STS-107 was compared to previous foam strike events, none of which caused the loss of an orbiter or crew. 164 On January 29, William Riatti, the Associate Administrator for Spaceflight, agreed to DoD imaging of the orbiter, but on the condition that it would not interfere with flight operations, ultimately, the orbiter was not imaged by the DoD during the flight. 38 On board the orbiter, the crew stowed loose items and prepared their equipment for re-entry. 38 The orbiter began to yaw to the left as a result of the increased drag on the left wing but this was not noticed by the crew or mission control because of corrections from the orbiter's flight control system. At 8.53, 46 a.m., Columbia crossed over the California coast, it was traveling at Mach 23 at an altitude of 231,600 feet, and the temperature of its wing's leading edges was estimated to be 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. 38 soon after it entered California airspace, the orbiter shed several pieces of debris, which were observed on the ground as sudden increases in brightness of the air around the orbiter. 43 at approximately 9.12 a.m., when Columbia would be conducting its final maneuvers to land, a mission control member received a phone call that discussed news coverage of the orbiter breaking up. The crew's remains were exposed to hot gas and molten metal as they fell away from the orbiter. After the orbiter broke up, reports came into Eastern Texas law enforcement offices of an explosion and falling debris. Columbia was the first orbiter, and it had a unique flight data OEX recorder to record vehicle performance data during the test flights. Debris was laid out on the floor of the hangar in the shape of the orbiter to allow investigators to look for patterns in the damage that indicated the cause of the disaster. The search for Columbia debris ended in May. 203 approximately 83,900 pieces of debris were recovered, weighing 84,900 pounds, 
which was about 38% of the orbiter's overall weight. RCC panels from the left wing were found in the western portion of the debris field, indicating that it was shed first before the rest of the orbiter disintegrated. 173 on STS-107, Columbia was carrying the extended duration orbiter, which increased its supply of oxygen and hydrogen. While there were no materials or adhesives on board Columbia that could have survived re-entry, the board researched the effectiveness of stuffing materials from the orbiter, crew cabin, or water into the RCC hole. The orbiter boom sensor system, a camera on the end of the canadarm, was added to allow the crew to inspect the orbiter for any tile damage once they reached orbit. The plan involved the stranded mission docking with the ISS, on which the crew would inspect and attempt to repair the damaged orbiter. 89-91 Prior to the arrival of the rescue mission, the stranded crew would power on the damaged orbiter, which would be remotely controlled as it was undocked and deorbited, and its debris would land in the Pacific Ocean. Upon reaching orbit, the crew inspected Discovery with the orbiter boom sensor system. On July 29, Discovery rendezvoused with the ISS and, prior to docking, performed the first rendezvous pitch maneuver to allow the crew aboard the ISS to observe and photograph the orbiter's belly. The orbiter carried a 28-feet remote control orbiter in-flight maintenance cable that could connect the flight deck systems to the avionics system in the mid-deck, it would allow the spacecraft to be landed remotely, to include controlling the landing gear and deploying the parachute. In October 2004, both houses of Congress passed a resolution to change the name of Downey, California's Space Science Learning Center to the Columbia Memorial Space Center, which is located at the former manufacturing site of the Space Shuttle Orbiters.